Jeff Ogilvie survives wing foot. Now the moment Aaron Badley has waited. Curry Webb is the five-time Australian Open champion. Golf at its best by one of the best in golf, Peter Thompson. Stand in front of a crowd like this today and win the PGA Championship is pretty special. He's done it at last. Greg Norman. Gets his name on the Stonehaven Cup. Leash been to 11 under. Now we've got a new leader, kids. Here it is. Adam Scott. A life changer. Coming up next, you have unrestricted access to golf across Australia and the world. Thanks to Golf Australia, we're going inside the ropes. Subscribe now on iTunes or your favourite podcast app or head to golf.org.au. G'day everybody, welcome to Inside the Ropes for the first time in 2020. Great to be back, great to have you with us. A special audio and visual uh, podcast this week. If you're watching it, you know that we're doing that. If you're listening to us on the podcast, the traditional form, uh, there'll be a couple of bits and pieces throughout that might sound a little bit odd, but you'll get the gist on the way through. Heaps to get stuck into as we kick off another massive year. And it wouldn't be Inside the Ropes without Mark Hayes. Hello, mate. Hello, Murray. Welcome back. You've spelled well by the looks of it. Yeah, I've been in a very solid paddock. Thank you very much for for noticing. I appreciate that. (laughs) Cruise is never good for the waistline. Oh, you did go on a cruise, didn't you? did go on a cruise. Was there a golf net on the cruise? There there was? There was, actually, yeah. I was listening to an ad for a cruise ship, the Royal Caribbean, Mm. on a podcast I listened to. And they've got a, uh, a surf pool. A wave pool. You can go and surf on the... Oh, sign me up for that. How good's that? Yeah, that's a winner. Get you on your 12-foot longboard. You'd absolutely <laughs> kill it. Uh, Mike Clayton, lovely hey, to see hey, you. Hey. This must be the first time that you've ever... For people who are listening, you're not privy to this, but Clates has actually put on the Golf Australia issued shirt for the uh, televisual experience. I have. They must have bent your arm to get you out of one of your Lacostes yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah, that's a good size for Rosie over there. <laughs> for, 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 anyway, that's all right. Are you well? I'm good, just back from the Australian Amateur. You, we, were you there? Did I see you there? No, I, no, didn't, go to the, I didn't go to the uh, Australian Amateur, but we had a couple of good winners, so that was, uh, it was good to see. We'll get to that a bit later on, because a good friend of the pod mm. won the men's side of the draw. Very true. Which is excellent. And speaking of good friends of the pod, and the television show for that matter, uh, it's a shout-out to Jack Nicholas, who turns what particular age uh, today? 80. 80. Can you believe the Golden Bear is now 80 years of age, Andy? Um, yeah. It doesn't seem like yesterday when he was 46 and winning the Masters. It's been another 34 years. That's true. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Um, it seemed long ago when he was 30. It was the second British Open I remember, 1970. John Huggin was there. He watched Doug Sanders miss that part. Mm. Did you ever play with him? Yeah, I did, yeah. Nicholas, I'm, I'm not, not talking about Australian Huggin, Open I'm talking about Nicholas, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I played with the Australian Open in 1978. What was he like to play with? Great, he's good. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was really good. I mean, he was unbelievably good. That was the year you won the Australian Amateur. It was, yeah. It and was. how'd you go? Oh, I chopped it. Completely <laughs> chopped it. <laughs> you and probably had 68 and no, still no, I completely you chopped, chopped it. it. It was embarrassing. As Mac O'Grady said, everyone should suffer in the crucible of humiliation. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? What was he? I mean, what was he like as a bloke to play with? Was he engaging? And did yeah, he, he was yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, we spoke a bit. He was good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do you reckon he played any mind games with you? Did he save them? With the... me? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. No, no. He didn't, Jack didn't need to play any mind games there, except maybe Trevino and Tom Watson yeah. at that point. I mean, his record is exceptional and he is the greatest, yeah. you know, depending on how you measure these mm. things, the greatest of all time. But was he, did he do anything that you remember being, you know, like Norman with the old persimmon and, you know, you see Kepka now hitting it. These, did, did Nicholas do anything that was... The only driver I met, I remember two drivers here, he had an awful... Healy necky cut into the base of Dunks Hill the first day. And then he bombed a high cut. Yeah, it was a different tee they played at 14. He bombed a high cut over the trees. It's a massive, big, high, long cut. But I remember his iron shots. He was, he was this unbelievable seven iron into the fourth hole. Remember? Well, that's how the, the tee was 40 yards forward of where it is now. He had this amazing shot just. It just went all over the pin the whole way. But, but you've done that. We've all had... I mean, we've all, yeah, but it just looked different. So it just looked different. different it was higher yeah, and right, softer. Okay, yeah, yeah. And he, yeah. Was, he shot 66 a second day. He just putted the ice out of yeah, it. Right. Played well and just 20... It was a great 20-foot putter. Just yeah. whacked him in one after the other. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you like his course designs? Yeah, he's done some good ones. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Would, uh, you, would you say if you thought one was absolutely rubbish? 
Not on here. <laughs> 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 in fairness, I don't think he did a The Australian was the first course he ever did on his own. Mm. And I don't think he did a great job there. I think that was it. What about his rejig of the Australian? Well, it was just a rejig of his rejig. Mm. You know, he completely changed the original course. And I, you know, I don't think he did a great job of that, in fairness. But, there you, which, you know, yeah. members of the Australian probably know what I... It's not my favourite course in Australia. But, you know, I think it was a classic case of... An inexperienced, well, 38-year-old designer. It would it's never hard, happen now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A 38-year-old yeah. American golf pro never designed a golf course being given one of the best courses in the country to do as your first design mm. job. And that mm. would never happen now. Mm. Well, but but it, was, it was a different time and everything American was great. And, and we got a course that everyone thought was great at the time because well, it just replicated what we saw in America. And it, it was a, literally an era when everything American was great. And I think we've grown up from that. You know, Peter Thompson was the one who educated us on that. You know, that not everything in America is great. Why are we blindly following the Americans? Yeah. We, well, while we're talking about this... As did, sorry, as did Paul Keating when he was on the 7.30 report last year talking about the difference between Australia and America. Exactly the same thing. You know, we should be proud of what we are and why, why are we blindly following well, America? Well, Peter Fitzsimons, while we're going yeah, down the political route, exactly he, right, he yeah. pointed out that in America, a bloke like their current president can get elected, whereas when a bloke in Australia who comes from the same sort of place as Donald Trump did, Clive Palmer tries it, we laugh him out of the joint. We can't get but a vote, really. We can't get a vote, yeah. exactly right. <coughs> did you think we were going to be talking about Clive Palmer and Donald Trump within the first five minutes of the show this year? Probably not, no. but, you know, nothing surprises me with the way we right, roll this show out every day. We should mention while we're on course designers, Pete Dye. Well, there you go, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd probably leave it to Clates to talk about it, but unfortunately Pete Dye is no longer among us. Clates? Um, yeah, he was uh, 94, the, probably the most influential designer of the, 20, the second half of the 20th century. Why so? Well, he, he said, I saw what Robert Trent Jones was doing and I went off in completely the opposite direction. And um, Trent Jones was the first great designer post the war and he was building long, difficult, kind of give your course a signature, lots of water, Firestone. And Di went off and went to America, went to Scotland and studied the great links of Scotland and came back and did Harbour Town with Nicholas. And, you know, he... he he did something completely different. Mm. But the, the, maybe his biggest legacy was training. You know, Bill Corr worked for him, Tom Doak worked for him, lots of great young designers worked for Di and went out on their own and adopted his model of... P prior to him, there was a lot of draw plan, give it to a construction company. There was a big boom in golf course design and the construction companies were building courses based on plans. And mm. Di went out and built his own work. He, mm. fam he famously said that there was an associate who turned up at a... Uh, site one day with, with, a, with a map and, and plans. He said, what are the plans for? He said, well, what are the plans for the golf course? He said, I don't need them. I'm here every day. Mm, mm. And that's the method that Bill Core, the three best you know, design companies in the world now, Bill Core and Crenshaw, Doak and Gil Hans. That's what they do. They build their own work. So mm. Dye's legacy was going out and building his own work in the ground. Yeah, yeah. And you can probably tell, I imagine. Um, there's a lot to get through on the show today. Heaps to discuss. Obviously, a big preview of the Women's Australian Open, which is just around the corner. We've got the Vic Open before that, which everybody in this neck of the woods looks forward to enormously. Um, you talk about the loss of Pete Dye. Great sadness felt around the world of golf uh, regarding that. Australia's had a hell of a summer. We know that, particularly up the eastern seaboard with the bushfires and... It's been remarkable to see the way uh, people in the world of sport in particular have rallied uh, to chip in and do what they can. Golf is no exception to that, Hazy. Yeah, we saw the Australian Golf Industry Council, Andy, a couple of weeks ago um, start a, a fundraising cause with $100,000 contributed to it by its, uh, by its members, including the foreign tours as well. Uh, I think it's going to be an ongoing process, mm. as I hope it is for all Australians uh, around this cause. Um, there are some clubs that are doing some great things. There are some very simple things like uh, just donation tins in some pro shops. But um, perhaps what we're best to do uh, in light of everything that's going on mm. around the tournaments at the moment is just to keep people up to date so that it doesn't go off the, he, the, he, off the, off the boil yep. in the next few months. I'll point out a couple, if you don't mind. Um, the Bansdale Golf Club uh, in Victoria on the 27th of January, so next Monday, uh, is part of the Gippsland East Relief Fund. They're having a, um, a day down there. Uh, I know that uh, Jeff Graham and the club are doing everything they can to sort of 
uh, promote it and get everyone involved. So if you do get the chance and you're in that area and you want to do something that's golf related and for a good cause, get down to the Bansdale Golf Club. Give uh, Jeff Graham a call. Mm. Um, specifically as it relates to the Women's Australian Open, uh, obviously those in Kangaroo Island in South Australia have had a really tough go. And they often get brushed aside, I think, a little bit in the big picture of the way it's portrayed in the media. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on down there. There's a hashtag called Book Them Out, which is being thoroughly promoted around uh, South Australian tourism channels in particular. Uh, hook on to the South Australian Tourism Commission on the social media, uh, their, their social media outlets, uh, and follow Book Them Out, hashtag Book Them Out. We want to get people, as many as we can, back down to Kangaroo Island. Uh, try and, they've been devastated, mm, absolutely really devastated, yeah. particularly on a, um, a tourism basis. So if we can do our, what we can there, check that out and get down there and help them. Good words. Um, we'll be speaking a, f- a whole lot about South Australian golf when we get stuck into the Women's Australian Open. There was a f- part, one of the quartet of images we saw then was Cam Smith and golf's woken up. It's come out of its sort of Christmas slumber in other parts of the world than just here in Australia, of course. And a fortnight ago, Cameron Smith um, showed how close it was to his heart yeah. What's going on here in Australia after a fantastic performance over in Hawaii? We all marvelled at what he did at the President's Cup and speaking his mind and everything, but then he, to come out and win so early in the season yeah. was awesome. His second win on the PGA Tour, his first as an individual, um, but then to be so emotive about what Australia means to him and the bushfires and the devastation going on at home. Uh, really, I mean, not that you needed any additional information yeah. about yeah. Cameron Smith and who he is, but just really showed... Uh, what drives him, I think. And, and I think for him to sort of uh, be so emotive is a, is, a, is a great portent for what he could be for us more broadly in the future. Here, here. Just on the President's Cup, before we get stuck into the stuff that's happening here and now and over the weekend, mm-hmm. the, the status of Royal Melbourne, we saw a lot of players came down here en masse who either hadn't been here before or had mm-hmm. and hadn't been here for a while. And the glow, the reflected glow out of the sand belt, but specifically through Royal Melbourne, was extraordinary. Do you think this is going to have any impact on scheduling of global golf going forward? Do you think there'll be a willingness for either of the big tours to go, you know, we need to rethink our, our Christmas slate here and include some tournaments down there? Well, it depends on the willingness of people who control the money to, to bring a tournament here. But Royal Melbourne show. A friend of mine rang me. He's a pro at Atlantic, which is the course up on Long Island where Bernie Madoff was a member. You never thought Bernie Madoff would be thrown in. In fact, fact, Rick Rick's got Bernie Madoff's club still in his office, I think. Um, He rang me up. So he was asking me about the fires, and he said, "How amazing! How amazing did the Royal Melbourne course look on TV?" He said, "It must be the best course in the world," which it arguably is. Mm. That West course is so. The composite course is. You can make an argument that's the best course in the world. Yep. So the reputation of Royal Melbourne was amazingly enhanced by that tournament because the first time ever, I think, more people watched on TV, Twitter and stuff like that, it just went, you know, people were going nuts about yeah. how great that course looked. Tiger playing brilliantly helped. It showed what a great course it was and how well he had to play to get around it. Yep. And by the way, he was clearly the best player there. Mm. Um, he must look at the other 11 blokes on his team thinking, none of these guys can beat me at Augusta if I play my best. Yeah. So, you know, I think, and I think the money it brought in was, I mean, I know, Metro, where I'm a member, I think, bought in $160,000 of green fees in a week. I went down to St Andrews Beach, another well, one of yours. the same. They, they, oh, they were off the charts, yeah. so, so I think that the, the people it bought to Melbourne who spent money on golf it was incredible, which yeah. is encouraging for a government who paid a lot of money for the tournament to bring it here in the first place and encouraging that they bring something like that here again. What do you think, Hazy? Yeah, I think the influencers um, who came out for the President's Cup were blown away. Yeah. So I think that can only have a long-lasting positive effect as well. And they didn't play just Royal Melbourne. In fact, most of them didn't play Royal Melbourne, but they played the rest of the Sandbelt and they played the rest of the Victorian courses. Yeah. And, you know, some of them went down to Barnboogle and, and um, into Cape Wickham and yeah. Ocean Dunes and they were just blown away generally. Some stopped in, in New South Wales and played up there. Some went to Adelaide and played in Adelaide. Uh, they were just generally blown away by Australian golf and I don't think they expected that when they came. We don't spend a lot of time on this show talking about top hundreds. Mm. We, don't, we, don't, we just don't because it's a, you know, it's a very subjective. Mm. But are you surprised, not surprised, have they got it right universally with where these Tasmanian courses are and the, and the yeah, kick? Absolutely. Not, they've got it right? Oh, well, yep. I haven't played Ocean Juice, but I've played Cape Wickham. King Island course as well. Um, and obviously the two at Bamboo. Yeah, they're clear in the top five yep. courses in the country. Yep. And I think you know, Golf Australia is not the Golf Australia, the body, but the magazine. 
the rating list came out last month, I think uh, I think you could say that the 30th, the 25th best, every course in the top 25 right now would have been in the top 10 30 years ago. Right. That's how much better golf yep. is in Australia now yep. than it was 30 years yep. ago. Yep. Now, Kingston is a much better course than it was. Victoria is much better. All the new courses have been built. All the old courses have been rebuilt. Uh, and Gil Hansen is going to redo Royal Sydney, which will bump that up 20 spots. So, you know, I think golf architecture has really been, you know, the last 30 years have really been productive for, yep. for golf yep. architecture in Australia. Yep. Which I think heightens the need, Andy, for us to have globally exposed tournaments. That's so, to make sure that we have... Sort of the point, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. You know, like, get down here and... But the, I, would, I would like to think, Clates and Hazy, that the players come down here, they have a golfing experience mm. like the one they had at Royal Melbourne, and they would think they would want to be tested under tournament conditions on those sorts of courses, that it's not just about money. They're all... The amount of money... I oh, know, oh, oh, I'm, so I'm, I'm yeah, like a yeah, babe yeah. in the woods, you know, yeah, like, yeah. what am I saying? But do you know what I mean? Surely somewhere in the psyche of... or in the, the will and the heart and mind of these players, they want to go, yep, I won a tournament at Royal Melbourne, or yep, I won a tournament at... St Andrews, or yep, or, you know they want to tick these well, things off. You no, know, well, if they did, they would come and play more. Yeah, agreed. Without yeah. having their pockets filled with more money, mm. they can jump over. We might get a, a, a sample of that this year, Andy, when the Australian Open returns to Melbourne for the first time, and we'll see without a multi-gajillion dollar tournament, yeah. what lure that has, what, yeah. pa- what drawing power that yeah, actually has. Yeah, good point. Because I mean, yeah. we might see the Zach Blairs of the well, world. And Brendan Todd, who's now leading the main list, well, I think still in America. I he, think so. Bradley Hughes. Brad Hughes, is, yeah. he, Brad Hughes sent me a message last week saying Brendan Todd wants to play the Australian Open, so... Great. There you go. Should be great, so... Right, so uh, tournament play has sort of woken up a bit after, particularly on the big two tours, which... We don't. We're not always singing uh, out of the same hymn book that they'd want us to. But you know, particularly <laughs> on some of the courses they get to play it. But they do throw up some remarkable stories. Uh, Abu Dhabi, Lee Westwood. This is what he, what he achieved on Sunday over there is a marker of some significance. I reckon he now has won, and they made a bit of a deal of this on the on the commentary. So it's not my research that. But he's now won a stroke play professional tournament in each of the last four decades. Lee Westwood. So he's one short of Peter Senior. No. No, he's well short of Peter Senior. Did you see what he did in Glenelg last, last, this month no, it's earlier? Not a tour event. No, I know, but it, as, a prof- as a professional. But Peter won in five. In fairness, the first one was in 1979. Yep. But he, Peter won in five decades, which is pretty That's, amazing. That is pretty amazing. Well, it wasn't a stroke play tournament, it was Blitz Golf at Glenelg. But yep. I'm going to say. Did he six, win that? I'm going to say six now, Clates, as a professional a against the Australian PGA <laughs> Tour. So he won the Blitz Golf. <laughs> He's now one of the 70s, but 80s, 90s, noughties, 10s, and 20s. Well, the kids ought to be ashamed of themselves if they're still losing to Peter Senior. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not embarrassing. embarrassing. <laughs> that, but that's, that is amazing. Uh, it's a mark of sheer genius. It, and the willpower of the bloke to just keep. I mean, he's obviously a great player. He's a tremendous player. But his pretty a brilliant player. Before we leave Cameron Smith, yep. what about the US Tour last week and the Patrick Reed debacle? Oh, I've been waiting for this. What do you got? Well, the, the fact that Smith was admonished for what he said, <laughs> where he never called him a cheat. No. Beyond belief <laughs> that the Tour would pick that one up. And then that Gary Williams on Golf Channel was all over him as well, saying what Smith did was as bad as what Reed did, I think was what he said. I didn't say that. Uh, I'm going to need to research that because if, if that's true, Clates, I'll be... Has Gary Williams got a social media presence? <laughs> if he has, it's incumbent upon every listener of Inside the Ropes to bombard him <laughs> and give him a sense of reality. Well, fact, you know, I didn't think what Cameron Smith said was anything out it's of the It's absolutely order. outstanding what yeah. he said. Mm. But and for the US Tour to drag him aside and say, ah, uh, ah, uh, it's like... Really? So what's their issue? Their, their issue, they're obviously their terrified to upset that, players. Their issue is that they think he called Patrick Reed a cheat, which he didn't do. They needed to read it more, read more carefully what he said. But we'll, what, get a, we'll return to that one, Andy. Uh, We've got to keep pushing uh, on. You're right, eh? Uh, so West wins, remarkable. Uh, over in America, did you, Andrew Landry wins. Yeah. And it was a pretty nondescript leaderboard, to be honest. I think we'll see better, you know, sort of top tens, but with all due respect to those who were there, they're all fine players. Mm. Do you see this bloke's form line going in? Yeah. But he missed nine cuts out of ten. So, so, 
Missed, so he wins. Prior to that, missed cut, missed cut, missed, stop me whenever you like. Missed cut, missed cut, missed cut, missed cut, missed cut. Tied 23, missed cut, missed cut. In 2019, he played 28 times, 28 professional times, yeah. missed 15 cuts. And he wins, he just bobs up and, and looks like he's going to sort of take the gas a bit on the back nine, but to his credit, sort of steadies himself yeah. and gathers himself and wins. Played a brilliant last couple of holes, by the way, but. Mm. Um, Shows to me the almost insignificance of the early season, Andy. That's all I'll say on the matter. That's you said plenty, I reckon. Well, it shows how good those guys are when they play well. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're great players. Even mm. if you miss cuts to make the PJ Tour, you're a great player. Yeah. How much was the best ranked player in that field trying? That's what I'm getting at. Well, this is something you, you well, can... I, well, yeah. Ricky, Ricky, I think, is nine losses from 10 54-hole leads. Mm. So he was trying pretty damn hard. He's a pretty good player. He got beaten badly in the end. Yeah. Like, he was beaten by six, I reckon, in the end. Like he was, I think so. I think 24 or five might have won it. And I think Fowler might have been back on 17 or 18. 18, 18 so, yeah, yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's not good. He's got to get back to the orange cap, Ricky. He didn't have the orange cap on. <laughs> uh, Matt Kuchar wins in Singapore. Did he tip the caddy appropriately? Did he pay the caddy appropriately? Have we got any update on that? No, I'll take that. <laughs> I'll walk past that. He played well there. Travis Smythe, please he going well, Travis he Smythe. He's getting better, better. Yeah, Travis Smythe was uh, runner-up in the New South Wales Open. Chose rightly, mm. in my mind, to vo- to miss the Australian Open so he can make sure he kept his Asian Tour card and went to Mauritius. Did really well over there. He's come up at the start of the new year with his Asian Tour card. Top 13 in Hong Kong, now 11th in Singapore. Uh, he's going places. I reckon he's got it sussed out. Yeah, yeah he's, he's going to come on the podcast as soon as we can. He's had a good run. Down. Yeah, he's had a good run. No one's noticed well. it, but he's had a good run. Yeah, he's going really well. Still got the pony's heart? I think he's still yeah. packing the man bar. Okay, yeah. I don't think it's yeah. going to take a lot to get it off him. We might have to challenge him with something, I reckon, when right. he comes right. on. He should ask himself who was the first player ever to win a major out of the man bar, and there hasn't been one yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, the history's there to be made, Clate. Someone's going to do it sooner or later, much to your chagrin. Zach Murray saw- was all right, too. Yeah, Zach Murray and Scott Hamm both did well yeah. in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. So. That would be exciting for a kid like Zach Murray, wouldn't it? To stick your front, to look at the leaderboard. He, then there would have been moments when he was on the first page of that leaderboard. Well, the first day he was yeah. leading. Did he lead? 67. Seven under? Did he? Yeah. Walk around and see your name up amongst that yeah. sort of calibre of field. More importantly, he made 65,000 euros. So that's a yeah, he's on his nice way. way towards mm. making enough money to get your card play next year. Yeah, that's it. Tell you bloke who nearly... How close did he get to winning a major? You'll know. Miguel Angel Jimenez. He wins. He beats the old boys on the weekend. He did, yeah, he did, yeah. He's been sporting all sorts of different hairdos along the way. Yeah. <laughs> How close did he get to winning a major? He was a second or third in He's run up in the British yeah, Open. Yeah, yeah, an Open yeah. Championship one year, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, yeah, he was he close. I remember when he came out and played. He, he was a young Spanish kid. Came out when I was still playing. There you go. Didn't look any good, but he's still going. He's still going. Still really winning. Uh, LPGA, Gabby Lopez um, wins. She beats um, a couple in the playoff. NASA had a, had a Oka. <laughs> this, uh, is your, this is your Roma. one stumbling block. I'm really have trouble with some of the Japanese names. names. And Inby Park, much easier the Koreans. <laughs> Just go with Park. You're Gabby Lopez, close to that, it right. that hole was playing uh, the 18th hole which they had the, where they had the playoff. It was the hardest hole in that course all week. Long par three, which we can't get into now, Andy. I want to get to... Yeah. I know, because we've got to get to something else here, much more important. Oh, oh, can I just... But, but Gabby do, Lopez yeah. played that uh, seven times in the playoff, four times during the tournament, and was three under. There were six birdies there made for the entire week. And, they just she kept was, like, and she was three under. Right. That's a fantastic effort. Seven hole... So here's my trivia question. Seven hole playoff. What's the longest pr- professional tournament playoff in history? This is my trivia question. I, too. I was in a seven-hole playoff once, and I was longer than that with Roger yep. Davis. Um, probably at eleven, I reckon. Yeah. Do you remember? You're right. This is if you're going to get this, you get this. <laughs> no, I know. I give it away if you get well, this well, right. Well, we mentioned Kerry Murdoch before. Oh, you're not so. going to get this right. <laughs> no, I'm Don't not, you no, not going to get it right. No, I'm not. It was the 19. So I've done some research. The 1949 Motor City Open, clearly in, in Detroit. Detroit, right? Yeah. He beat a bloke called L- Lloyd Mangrum. L- Lloyd Mangrum. There you okay. go. Oh. At Medina. No. No. No, and here's the trivia. Here's the other part of the trivia question. Because I was reading Madonna's history book last week at Royal Queensland. It was at Meadowbrook. And okay. Right. Meadowbrook. Well, they played time. the US Open at Madonna that year. Okay. It wasn't. That was in 1950. In 1950, that was 49. It, in 1955, the, the Motor City Open wasn't held at the Meadowbrook Golf Club yeah. because it was won in 1954 by their club pro, a bloke by the name of 
Do you know who it is? One yeah. who on the Chick Harbour. Chick Harbour, yeah. Chick Harbour. Yeah, he was a tour player. Yeah, he was a good player. And then <laughs> they, really they good, petitioned yeah. to host the PGA Championship the next year, which they did, and it wasn't there the next year. So exactly. there you go. Did Chick Harbour win the PGA? He won the PGA, didn't he? Did he? I think he won a major. Well, who Harbour. won the Motor City Open in 1962? No, but you played a lot of golf with. 1960. Bruce Crampton. Oh, Bruce Crampton won. And it was won by Ben Hogan in 1960. I watched him play a lot. My. The sister said, why is that man's tooth? Why is that man's... I've told this story on this podcast before. She said to Bruce Crampton one year, why is that man... To my dad, who took us to the golf, <laughs> why is that man's teeth so yellow? He smoked a lot, didn't he, Crampton? Crampton? No, I don't think didn't he? Smoked, no, I don't think so. I thought it was Bruce Crampton doing something. In fact, we've had this conversation before no, and you said it wasn't Crampton. No, it wasn't Crampton. Yeah. Didn't he smoke... No, no, no. Yeah, right. You, are you giving me the bums rush? I am, mate. We've got a very special guest. We've got to get to it. All right. Well, go on. No, I think... Uh, I think we need to sort of get ready to talk much more about the... Uh, the Australian Women's well, well, Australian Open. Well, it's, it's coming up on the 13th to 16th of February in at Royal Adelaide, which we're all looking forward to enormously. We've got some... The, the awakening of Australian golf sort of occurs again over that fortnight with... The Vic Open being played, which brings so many players down here to Australia, and then so many of the women go from 13th to Adelaide thereafter. And we're looking forward to this enormously. We are. This is uh, w- this is the tournament annually that's got the best field in Australia. Yep. We have the occasional Presidents Cup that blows it out of the water, but we've got 15 major champions. 15. Here. 15 major champions rolling up to the Royal Adelaide Golf Club. Um, many of whom are in just ripping form. Mm. I'd like to put Inby Park up there as, as the as the prime contender. Um, you know, at one of the all-time greats in uh, in female golf, and she um, she's playing in Australia for the very first time uh, at both the, at the Vic Open. But is that the, right? Yeah. So she's coming to the women's uh, national championship for the that, very yeah. first time, and I, I, I urge everyone to get out there. She is one of the absolute legends, superstar. Um, Alan, Alan Shipnuck was asked on you know Alan Shipnuck. Oh, no. Well, of course, he's been a friend of ours on Twitter for a long time. Who was the player of the decade? Well, he wouldn't have said Mark Leishman. No, he said NB Park. Yeah. Second, Roy McIlroy. Yeah. Is that right? Well, there you yeah. go. Well, he's got that right then. So we'll the change his name back to Shipnark from Woodduck. I won't choose what we'll call him. He was saying all those things about Leishman a few years ago. Yeah. But I think among other names, Young and Lee Six, who was just in a, a breath of fresh air yeah. last year, one of the great characters of, of women's golf already, and she's coming back for a second crack in Adelaide. Uh, Nellie Corder, the defending champions, coming back. Of course, a really strong contingent of Australian players led by Minji Lee and Hannah Green. Um, Lizette Salas is coming back. She was, she's a great character yep. as well. Uh, Amy Yang, So Yon Yu's coming back. Uh, Marina Alex, Suo, of course, Clates. Um, yep. there's, there's a whole host of, of really big name contenders who are, who are legitimate title threats here at Royal Adelaide, and I, I can't wait to get over there. This is where the women embarrass the men. Well, but they embarrass the men on this on this kind of front. So and an NB entered, rented a house, mm. and they'll just turn up and play. Play, yeah. It's great. No, no give me a twenty-five thousand dollars first class airfare for my manager stuff. Yeah. They just enter the tournament and they turn up and play. Yeah. Because women's golf would fall apart if they didn't support it, and they do more than support it. They're amazing. Yeah. This. Is- this is my favourite tournament to go and watch, Andy. So, you've said this to you've said this on an, for a number of years now. Why yeah. do you like it so much? Uh, the women just give of themselves mm. and they engage the fans better than the men. It's pretty simple, actually. The Vic Open and the Women's Australian Open back to back weeks. It just it's how golf should be. Mm. Um, it, it, it thinks about it from a fan's perspective. Mm. Uh, it's as simple as that. Mm. Um, Hannah Green has just got some amazing things going on with the crowd every every time. So on you's the best smiler in the business. And, you know, gobbles Vegemite left, right, and centre, and she look and she looks like a an Aussie to the to the masses. You know, she she's one of us. Um, Georgia Hall's coming back. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, Christy Kerr's back again. Sarah Jane Smith's playing, having just had a baby. There's there's all sorts of great storylines, and the women are prepared to tell the stories. So this is the second year of a three-year deal that South Australia's got to host the Australian Open. It's at Royal Adelaide. Well, this is the sec- is this second the fifth or, third? or sixth one. This is the fifth one, isn't it? This yeah, is but f- it's a three-year deal that they've. I so it's another. What, what it's what? An- yeah, another yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, Royal Adelaide. In, um, where's so, some great golf courses in mm. South Australia. Terrific golf destination. Is it the pick of the courses over there? Yeah, I think it is. Yep. But um, Glenelg, two at the Grange, one of which I redid, one of which Greg redid. Yep. Neil Crafter redid Glenelg. Um, Royal Adelaide, which has always been a, you know, mostly a Mackenzie course. Mackenzie came and redesigned it. And there were amazingly letters in the paper, yep. hugely critical of this 
imported Scott, who was ruining our golf course. Because he was responsible for the third <laughs> hole, which is one of the great short par fours in Australia. And uh, yeah, it's a brilliant course for that, lad. We're going to do something here, Hazy. For people who are listening to the podcast, you're going to hear a bit of music. Uh, but people who are watching the, what do you call a podcast on telly? A vodcast? A, a vidcast? <laughs> a vidcast? A vodcast will do. Uh, we've got a little bit of uh, a vision package to just set up uh, what we've got to look forward to in South Australia. Goes right, doesn't it? So she was a very popular winner last year, and we had a lot, lot to look forward to at Royal Adelaide from the 13th to the 16th. To should, get it, should point out, Andy, yep. that for those who want to see that stinger and are listening on the normal podcast, just go through our normal Golf Australia yep. channels and that'll be up uh, front and centre very soon so that you can actually see the great vision that was prepared there. Sorry about that. And if that. you're under 23, you'll probably call it a sizzle reel. Sizzle reel? I think that's what, they, you know, what the youth of today call that sort of stuff. Oh, okay. To get a sense for why this event has the standing in the minds of so many international players, particularly so many of the Americans and, and the players that play on the LPGA Tour. It's probably worth speaking to somebody who's a bit closer to those players than we are on a weekly basis. And we've got a great friend of the pod <laughs> rejoining us to tell us why, Hazy. Especially when it's, uh, you know, one of the great podcasters in, um, in golfing history. I think that uh, Christina Lance, who's about to join us, has become a bit of a family of uh, no Inside doubt. the Ropes. And we welcome her back to Inside the Ropes for the first time in 2020, all the way from Florida. Welcome, Christina. Hey, guys. How are you? I'm glad to be here. You devastated that uh, this time there will be no Patriots in the Super Bowl before we start talking about golf. <sighs> yes, I am, actually. But you guys will get my full attention this year on Monday, <laughs> as opposed to seeing me run around the media center in my Tom Brady jersey. <laughs> my six-year-old nephew was also devastated because he was a Titans fan. But we will still, uh, we will still watch and cheer, cheer on with glee. I noticed Stephen A. Smith, Christina, just to go down this wormhole a little bit further, Stephen A. Smith, a renowned American sports broadcaster, is suggesting that Tom Brady should play for the Tennessee Titans next year. Well, they are kind of uh, New England South. They've got Vrabel out there, and uh, goodness knows uh, Brady and Vrabel are good friends. I personally am praying that that's a man that the GOAT, number 12, stays in Foxborough, but wherever he goes, he'll have a, a whole area following him. We just pray it's still far too much air in the footballs in uh, in Tennessee <laughs> oh, for that to happen. So let's let's just let's just push on to the yeah, uh, to the business at hand here, Christina. Watch it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. um, we're we're thrilled to have uh, not only yourself but also the LPGA circus come back to town in a couple of weeks' time. Obviously for the Vic Open, but um, for the purposes of this podcast, Christina, the ISPS hand of Women's Australian Open. It's it's shaping up to be another cracker. It's going to be a great week. We're all really excited to head back. Um, I certainly couldn't let you guys throw on another two tournaments without me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to get down and visiting with all of you again. Excited to see Royal Adelaide, a new course, um, after being down the street at Grange last year. Um, but I was looking through the field list, and we got a, a great list set up to, uh, to head down under and visit with you guys, including Nellie Corda. I was just with her at the Diamond Resorts Tournament of Champions here in Orlando this past week. And She's geared up and ready to go to defend her title. And, and we mentioned just before that Inby Park making her first trip for a tournament golf into Australia. Um, she looked the goods too there in Florida, and it, she must be chuffed to come down and, and, and see, you know, one of the most, uh, I guess, unheralded courses on the on the rotor. She's really excited to come down. We asked her, um, "What gets you out this early this year?" This is the first time she had teed it up in January since 2016. And 2016 and 2020 have two very important things uh, in common. They're both Olympic years. Currently, uh, Indy is not on uh, Team US, excuse me, Team Korea for the Olympics. Uh, she was on the outside looking in. Um, you can have up to four players per country as long as they're inside the top 15 in the rankings. I don't have uh, the rankings update right in front of me. I believe she did move up, but she's still on the outside looking in for Team Korea. Decided there were. A lot of events early that could help her uh, jump up her ranking. So she's taking full advantage. Teed it up last week in Orlando. 
currently uh, will be at our event in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, down near Miami this week. Then plans to tee it up in both Australia events as well as Singapore and Blue Bay, China, before coming back here to the U.S. So she's she's going all in to try and get back and defend her gold medal. I asked her about Australia. She said she's excited and ready to get down there. Christina, we spent a lot of time on this podcast lamenting the fact that some of the male players don't travel uh, as extensively as the females do. do. Give us a sense for why so many of the top players in the world are prepared to come down to Australia and play in these events. I think a lot of it, honestly, is the experience. Uh, it's, it's a great trip down there. We enjoy it. Enjoy getting to, to hang out first in, uh, in Barwon Heads at, at Vic Open and then make our way over to Adelaide. The people are great. The fans are great. We all love the coffee. I don't drink I, I don't I don't drink hot coffee, but guys, I had a flat white every day for two weeks last year. I'm excited to get back to that. Um, it, it's just the experience. The golf courses are great. Everyone loves it. Yes, it's a long flight. Um, yes, it's the first two weeks of, of five weeks over on, on your side of the globe for us. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things to be thought about, a lot of things to, to decide for, for personal reasons, but I know our players love coming over and and visiting the Australian golf courses and playing in front of the fans there. So keep, keeping that Adelaide focus, Christina, from your perspective, but also from the players, how how important is it for things like the Fringe Festival, which is just so impressive for visitors to Adelaide to take a part in? Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how important is that as a lure to, uh, to get the world's best players here, to have something to do when the golf clubs get hung up for the night? It's absolutely crucial, I think. Um, our players, they get out and they grind and they're working hard and they're out there when the lights aren't, when they have to have lights to be able to see on the putting green uh, to when the sun goes down. But at the end of the day, a lot of times when we're overseas, we're there without vehicles. So anything we can get out and walk to is key. And having the Fringe Festival right around the corner, I got over around the corner last year uh, with your lovely communications team and sat on a picnic table and had some amazing food and people watched and enjoyed I know a bunch of our players uh, went to various shows last year. I got to meet some of the performers, and it's great to have that. It's great to have the beach down uh, down the ferry, down on the tram that we could go down and visit. I got the opportunity to take a Penfolds tour last year. I know a lot of players have done that as well. So being able to get out and experience, for some players, this may be their first and only time they get to go to Australia. A lot of them like to make the most of that. So having things like the Fringe that we can get to so quickly and enjoy and really feel like we're at home, make that week in the hotel just a little more better. Christina, no, well, just before we let you go, I know it's not, no, no, it's not in your, your kind of job charter to individualise, but um, there's a lot of established, you know, sort of um, lead players on the LPJ Tour at the moment. Give me a name or two of a couple of the youngsters that um, might be buzz players that could are on that sort of edge of, on the cusp of emerging into the top ranks. Have you got a couple we should keep our eye on in 2020? How about I should keep my eye on in 2020? Man, you're putting me on the spot here. I'm uh, still getting to meet some of our rookies, some of our new names coming up. Um, but a, a name that's on the uh, the Women's Australian Open list that I think you should all keep an eye on is Kristen Gilman. She was a, a, a LPGA rookie in 2019, a graduate of the University of Alabama. Came on strong late in the year, one of only three rookies, uh, four rookies, excuse me, who qualified for our season-ending event. Had a great hole-in-one at our event in uh, in Korea, the, the BMW Ladies Championship. Won, uh, I believe, a BMW 7 Series. And so, was, no offense, it was to Toyota. It was a little nicer than her Camry. And so she was excited to, uh, to get back and drive that. She's actually a two-time U.S. Women's Am champ and won those titles, I believe, four years apart. So this girl's got game. Uh, she's tough. She, she likes to have fun. She'll be one I bet we'll see out at the Fringe Festival. And then we've also got a lot of up-and-coming rookies. We'll see a lot, I'm sure, out of Patty Tavitanikit and Yelini No. Uh, Patty won three times on the Symmetra Tour last year, our developmental tour, uh, to earn her way to the LPGA Tour via the Volvic Race or the card. And Yelini No twice was in contention to win after Monday qualifying, then ultimately did reach the Tour via Q Series. Uh, she turned pro at 17 after winning the... The girls' junior PGA, the U.S. women's, the U.S. girls' junior, excuse me, and the Canadian women's am in back-to-back weeks, three weeks in a row, three major amateur victories. So she's going to be a name we're going to see. She's already started making her splash, and I have no doubt 
uh, they'll all be excited as well. Well, Christina, for somebody who was caught on the hop with a question, you've actually done a magnificent job coming up with a couple of names for us. So uh, don't despair. There will be another run in the Belichick Brady era. Though I'm convinced they'll stick together and we'll get we'll just surround Tom with a couple of skilled players and, and we'll be right. So you and I and a few others will, have got a bit more to look forward to before we hang this one up. Thanks for joining us on the show again. We look forward to having you back down here. My pleasure. My flight leaves a week from tomorrow. I'm excited. Good on you. Christine Lance, LPGA senior manager for part of their uh, media team. It's, some, it's somewhat embarrassing as a some supposed golf media professional to stand next to her, Andy, when questions like that get thrown up because she knows way more. She's forgotten more yeah, than I know. Right. You raised a really good point there, and it's something I've never really thought about from a domestic perspective. Mm. I know it's hard. Clates is looking at me like, what? He raised a good point. He's all befuddled over there. But <laughs> the, over here in Australia, support our golf tournaments with bigger events. Mm. You mentioned um, the Fringe Festival in Adelaide. Mm. In, in Hobart, when the yachts come in for the Sydney to Hobart, they have the Taste Festival down in Hobart. Mm. So you get there, it's not just about the boats arriving, but once you're there, you've got this fantastic, mm. um, you know, kind of festival going on around it. 13th Beach does a bit of that. They, they kind of bring the ballerine to the tournament to mm. a degree. There's something in that, I reckon. Well, the Irish Open at La Hinch had a massive street party at La Hinch the right. whole week, really, which they could easily do at Bowen Heads. It would be great to close off that street. And yeah. It would be fantastic. But the, the, the Vic Open is a... That, 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 that does that really well. Really well. Yeah. Yeah, R- Rundle, Rundle Mall in, in uh, Adelaide. No, no, there's a like Hindley Street. Hi- well, no, all those parts, yeah. but more, more at the, uh, I guess, what would it be, the eastern end of the, of, I'm just testing my geography there, but the I eastern think that's end right, yeah. where yeah. they shut down the streets and just have the restaurants spill out onto the, uh, the footpaths and yeah. actually across the roads in some cases. It's, just, it's awesome. It's yeah. genuinely awesome. It's one of the, the best festivals in Australia and that it ties in with the golf is a happy coincidence for us because we love going there. Yep. It's just a cracker. And um, with all the other great sport on Andy around that time in Adelaide as well. Yeah, true. Um, you know, the, the cycling, the, we just had the tennis with Ash Barty. We've, we've, there's so much going on. AFLW starting up, of Absolutely. course, the, the defending champions, the Adelaide Crows. Yeah. 53,000 people. I got to the grand final over there last year, Clates, at... The Adelaide Oval. Good for them. Knocked over the Carlton <laughs> Footy Club. We'll get them back this year. No. Uh, so if you want to know uh, where to watch it, it's on the ABC's got extensive coverage of the Ice Peace Hand at Women's Australian Open. Uh, we'll be there again with radio coverage, so stick the things in your ears and have a listen when you're out on the course. Well, for the first time, Andy, because we've done it before at the Men's Australian yep. Open a handful yep. of times, but this time we're branching out. Brilliant. Um, so Fantastic. we're going to have that coverage on the weekend. Uh, on the Saturday and Sunday for all the afternoon. Um, so stand stand by for more details on that, and maybe a bit of a, um, a bit of a surprise at the Vic Open too. But that's going to be outstanding, and, and and arguably about time. And tickets available if you're listening to this and you think, you know what, I've got a bit of time up my sleeve. I might head over to Adelaide to take all of that. In tickets are available at Ticket Tech. Uh, and if you want any more of the uh, details, it's priced up on the screen now. 25 bucks for individuals, $19 concession, kids under 16 free, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, if you want to find out any more of the details about any of that, go to womensozopen.com. Just to go out and have a look at Royal Adelaide too. Mm. I mean, it is a world-class course. Mm. It's, the, it's the hidden... It's not hidden, it's just a... Yeah, it's been the world top 100 for years. Yeah, right, not, just a not often <coughs> seen or known course... Um, by the masses, but it is a cracker. If you've never been in the gates, because you just drive past and you wouldn't know what was in there, it's a beauty. It's an absolute beauty. One of my first ever golf memories, and it's not about me, this is a segue into you, and I know you don't like talking about yourself, but one of my first ever, you would have played in this tournament, one of my first ever memories watching golf as a kid was on the ABC Mm. back in the late 70s. Must have been, I'm going to say it was at the Grange when Norman won the... Westlake. Westlake's. Westlake's classic. No, I wasn't. Yeah, well, I was. We, we, the, you would have played in that, wouldn't you? No, no. This will tie into the Australian Amateur. Why did you play in that? Amateur last week at Royal Queensland. Yeah. We played the Interstate Series at Royal Queensland. I played Peter Senior. Wayne Grady was in the team in 1976, and Greg was the assistant pro. He was picking up the balls for us on the range. That was it. Easter. What year? Easter 1976. So yeah. April 76. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Westlake's was the same year. Probably in September, maybe October, probably October. So six months later, he was he won the Westlake's Classic. That is unbelievable. Did you know about yeah, yeah. him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played. We played. I first saw him play in nineteen seventy four in the Junior Series in Sydney. Yep. And a friend of mine said, "Go watch this guy play. He's incredible." 
and he just smashed it. <laughs> like for you know, 970, he had this little Jack Nicholas persim- no, the Strata block driver, shallow fed with a small B51. He just smashed it. Remember the buzz out of out of that week? The, no, it was incredible. It was like, oh, the yeah. light's gone on. It was something yeah. a bit special, well, wasn't it? We had a 10-shot lead after three yeah. days. Yeah. We shot 64, 67, 66. Yeah. Then shot 74. But, I mean, no one could believe it. I mean, but I'd seen him play. Everyone who'd seen him play knew how good he was. Yeah. And there he was, picking up balls on the range. Six months before he's... Come on, kid. Picking balls, <laughs> picking range balls at him. What was your best... Oh, I'm interested only because I'm. What was your best result over in South Australia in your playing uh, days? Choked away a South Australian Open one year. I bogeyed the last two holes to lose to Terry Gale. By oh. shot. By two. No. And Wayne Grady beat me by one as well. <laughs> well, have a look yeah. at some of the more beautiful in here. We don't want to have replays of you taking the gas, but <laughs> it is a magnificent part of the world, as again on the audio podcast, you won't know what we're looking at here, but. Beautiful pictures of flowers, waves and bees. I mean, uh, this is a lovely part of the world. Uh, it's, it's just people pot it and it's so stupid because it's so much to do over there and the scenery is breathtaking. So um, I'll we'll... tell you, one of the best potential roads of amazing golf courses, equal to the Sand Hills in Nebraska. If you drive from Robe to Adelaide, you just drive past, I don't know how many, hundreds of, hundreds of kilometres of just... <laughs> Unbelievably perfect landed for golf courses. Right. It's incredible. Are there any golf courses along the way? I, don't, I didn't see one. Right, but you could build. You could build fifty. Just go and do what they did to watch his Richard down in Barn Bugle, knock on someone's door and say, "Listen, can we have a thousand acres?" Is, and we well, so why does Barn Bugle work? Because it's it's hard to get to. You've got to drive to. But how hard is it to get to Barn Bugle? Barn Bugle, you get in a plane, you, you fly there, and it's. I always think Bamboogle would work, only would work in Tasmania. Why do you say um, that? Well, because you've got to make an effort to go there, yeah, but it's yeah. not physical. You don't have to drive in a car for eight hours. If you had to drive two hours past road to a course in the middle of nowhere, from Melbourne it's a 12-hour yeah, no, drive. Yeah, of course, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. maybe you can fly to Warrnambool and drive, but, this, you know, it's just trickier. I so Bamboogle the- works because it's actually so hard to get to. It's actually, it's like driving on English roads. They're actually so unsafe, they're safe. Yeah. Bamboogle's so, <laughs> so tr- well, I was going to say difficult. It's so tricky to get to, but it's actually easy to get there. Yeah. To drive to even road golf club or Port Ferry, it's a more of an effort. But the land's incredible. It's incredible land yeah. for golf. Yeah. So the South Australian government should be... All over someone like Richard Sattler and Billy in a golf course on that street. Exactly, they should. They should be listening to you right now. Um, okay, uh, a bit of general business before we wrap this thing up. Uh, Hannah Green, she'll be, is she turning it up? Of course yeah, she well, yep, we, yep. Yeah, we should mention that. Uh, Hannah Green um, will be, as we mentioned before, one of the, you know, the store of Australian uh, chances, I suppose. That's, yep. a bad, that's a bad phrase there. Store, which has been in play for two years. Yeah. <laughs> of Australia's chances, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe a bad word. Sorry about that. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, we'll um, we'll no doubt see a lot of her through yeah. the four days on the course. But she's done a lot in preparation too, and she continues to be a great giver in terms of media. And but more importantly for the juniors um, in, in Australian golf, and she set up uh, a, a cracking little video, which I think we should have a look at. Thomas, you got a present from somebody. Hi Alice, it's Hannah here. I heard a little whisper that you've been saving up some money to come to the Women's Oz Open to watch myself and all the other LPGA players that are coming along. So as my Christmas present to you, I would love if you and your sister Rosie would come and join me in Adelaide for a few days. You guys will have the opportunity to come inside the ropes, hang out with me, see what life on the road is like at a tournament, and also just meet some amazing LPGA Tour players. So. Merry Christmas to you all, and I'll see you guys very soon. That does bring that brings a tear to your eye. That stuff, yeah, it does, doesn't it? That, that was a that's those, bloody amazing. Yeah, for those who uh, it, it really does. For those who couldn't see that on the audio mm. podcast, that's a little Christmas present that. At uh, Hannah shot for mm. uh, was it Alice? I think yeah, yeah, Alice, yeah, yeah. little Alice who's going to come along to to Adelaide and be part of the whole week with mm. uh, with with Hannah Green. Um, it does bring a tear to your eye to see the impact that um, you know now a major champion can have yep. uh, on the on the next generation. I can see your eyes. Oh no, I'm telling you, that, I, I hadn't. I'd seen I'd seen a clip of that without 
really sitting down and watching it quietly before. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm, my kids were watching. I had three daughters. They were watching. Um, I made sure they watched the mm. US Open when she, when she was closing in on winning it. And when she knocked in the last putt, my kids went bunta. Yeah. And uh, they went completely cocoa. And they are... They know who Hannah Green is. Yeah, they, right. they spend more time talking about Hannah Green in our house. Whenever I watch golf, her name will invariably get mentioned. Then we get in the back pages of oh, sporting yeah. newspapers around Australia and on nightly sports bulletins. Yeah. My kids would love to see more stories out there. It's amazing about how Hannah Green. much bigger a star amongst the general population is Ash Barty is than Hannah Green. It, when in fairness, they both did the same thing. Yep. The fact is, she, the only thing I can think about there that separate is that Barty got to number one. That feels yeah, like the no, only thing, true, you know. But, but you're right, it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 green, the magnitude of what Hannah Green did in 2019, I think in the broad sweep of things, was overlooked. I mean, we, we stood by the 10th tee on the West Course, I don't know, what, maybe the, the President's Cup, the 6th, I think, the little part four. Yeah. Hannah, Jared, her boyfriend, Sue, I, me... Huggy, I think. Not one person recognised her. No. Yeah, she, if Ash Barty had walked into a golf tournament, yep. they, would have, they all would have recognised her. Yep. She was walking around at the Australian yeah. Open yeah. watching Jared, yeah. and I told a couple of little kids, that, you know, that he's over there under that big hat. I went, no, who's that? And I said, Hannah Green. Oh, really? Yeah. Over they went, you know. So you're 100% right. Um, Australian amateur? Yeah, we mentioned it before. Mm. So Charlotte Heath from England became only the sixth British player to win in 125 years of the tournament, I believe. Um, but from a, an Australian perspective, and apologise um, for, for all our British listeners, but Jed Morgan, a friend of the podcast, uh, he's been on several times. He's, he's had the big breakthrough. And I think we talked earlier, Andy, about Cameron Smith. I think um, this is a, another effect of the Cameron Smith impact is having. Um, Jed Morgan is a disciple of Cameron Smith and, yep. and immediately thanked him and said, I'm on this path. Cam Smith won this event. That's where I want to get. Um, he was so excited. In front of he's a Royal Queensland member. He's from Hattonvale, out in the uh, the West, or uh, not the Wild West, but out out I think in the Darling Downs out there is probably the best way of describing it. Um, but now Royal Queensland member, and he had all the all the hordes of RQ members yeah. following him around. Clates. And I caddied for Elvis Smiley, who he beat in the third round. That was the closest match he had, three and two. So he dominated the whole thing. And Elvis had he was one up playing the seventh and had a bad shot. In the water, lost that. Mr. Putt to go one up again on the eighth. And then Jed, into the wind on the ninth, a massive hole, 600 yards, maybe bombed it on for two, made a birdie, went one up. And Elvis made three birdies and a bogey from there and lost three and two. Yeah. So Jed's, Jed, that. Jed's and, developed and, and, into a massive physical unit. Yeah. Big boy, yeah, big solid yeah. I couldn't believe yeah. how, how far he hit it. I yeah. mean, he bombs it. And he's got a great swing. So I, I, I really like Jed. For a myriad, for myriad reasons, Andy, but mm. I really like him for the fact that he knows how to win, mm. um, and he might have gone away and developed his physicality mm. or his length or whatever the last couple of years. But back when we were first talking to him on the podcast, it was because he was winning a lot of junior tournaments and because he was winning in Asia. Who knows? Yeah, no, no, I, no. I, I yeah. think you've, one of the key aspects of golf, and you've t spoken about this, Clates, in different formats, is um, being able to get the chocolates when you present, presented the chances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he's done that and it was with great emotion that he did and it. I watched him by the you know, He's playing the Vic Open now. In fairness, the, the women's field is the strength of that tournament. The men's field is not that good. You can win that. I said, you can win the Vic Open. Go yeah. get a card in Europe. Yeah. You know, that's not beyond... The way he's playing, that's not beyond his, any of his capabilities to win that tournament. Well, let's hope he, well, let's hope he does. You know, well, we can say the same that. thing to a number of players. Yeah. But um, last one before I let you... Tory Pines, a lot of big-name Americans will be playing mm. over there in America. I'm opening the door to anything he has. You know what I'm yeah, going to do? I do. I saw a little conversation you were having on Twitter with Cam Percy. Oh, yeah. He put out the four par threes at Tory Pines at 200 yards plus. Mm. Surely that's ridiculous. Well, that is, yeah, that's a terrible mix. His point was, have you ever seen a great par three over 200 yards, which I thought was equally silly because oh. and the, arguably the best hole in the world is at 16th at Cypress Point. And London's full of amazing 200-yard-plus par threes at the Addington and Berkshire. And, I mean, you know, oh, yeah. So there were lots of great 200-yard-plus par threes. But his point was well made. Speaking of Tory Pines, we can draw a bow here. Tom Crow used to live at La Jolla, just around the corner. Australian Amateur Champion, 1963, died last week, sadly. Yeah. Started Cobra Golf. He invented the Little yeah. Slammer. Yeah. One of the nicest men in golf ever. Amazing bloke. 
And he's no longer with so us. So he died last week. Which significant was really contribution. Yeah, he was a yeah. Yep. great club maker. Yep. Great help to all the Australians who went over there. Yep. That'd be pretty hard felt among some yeah. of the Yeah, I mean, everyone loved Tom Crow. He was yeah. the greatest bloke ever. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's a sad Tiger. note to start the show on and a sad note to finish it on. But um, Yeah. Uh, but we should mention Tiger's coming back, Andy. Oh, yeah, that's... Probably worth mentioning, I thought. At the same yep. tournament. Indeed. 176 under he is in 17 trips around the course that no one else can par. And if you want to watch, <laughs> quickly, two US Open That's champions. That's unbelievable. Yeah, if unbelievable. you want to watch two US Open champions, play a little charity day. Tee up for kids charity day at Peninsula on the 2nd of February. So Young you and Jeff Ogilvie. Sue O's there, Jack Murray. Yes. Marcus Fraser. So Young's playing with Daniel Andrews, the Premier. Yep. He's supporting it. So Fantastic. just a little charity day, but... Rock up. It's nice to raise like some money donation. for the kids. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Eight, um, o'clock on, 8 o'clock on February the 2nd. Feb 2. Yep. Good point. Um, that's it. Episode number 141, Hazy. Well done, Andy. I got that out. You've done well. Thanks for being part of it all again for the first time in 2020. We'll be back next week to do it all again.